In this video, I'm going to draw and describe the various attributes of a surgical screw and how these attributes apply to various screw applications. So first of all, a screw is, can be described as a simple machine or a, a device, a mechanical device that converts rotational force to a linear motion. So from the left, I'm going to start to draw the head of the screw. So this is very simplified. And then from the head, you have the run out or the countersink of the screw. And where that meets the shaft is the neck of the screw. And this is the shaft. And then you have the threads, which simply can be drawn like this. And I'll draw about six threads or so. And you can draw this very, relatively quickly for the examiner. And then you have the tip of the screw here. And some screws also have a flute. So if I start labeling this, so this is the head of the screw. Now the head of the screw has two functions. Firstly, it allows um, a recess for a screwdriver to be connected. And this could either be a hex or a star drive. And this basically allows a screwdriver to actually turn the screw to create that rotational force to allow it to be converted into linear motion. The second function is it halts uh, or arrests the forward motion of the screw as the, as the head engages into the cortical bone or indeed a plate. So they're the two functions of the head. This is the runout of the screw. Now the runout um, can either be conical like this, which allows it to uh, countersink and engage into the cortex of the bone or, or even the plate or it can be threaded uh, where it, it, it's a locking screw and it can lock into the threads of a plate, create, creating an angular stable device. This is the neck of the screw, which, uh, which marks the, uh, the, uh, the transition between the head and the shaft, and it's the weakest point of the screw. And this is the shaft of the screw. These are the threads. And here you have the thread depth. And the thread depth is the uh, effective purchase that the screw achieves uh, into the bone. Now, this diameter or, or this distance between the two threads is termed the pitch. Now the pitch, which I'll write down here as well, should not be confused with the lead. Now the lead is the distance the screw travels with one 360 degree turn, and that's the lead. However, if you have a single start screw, um, the pitch will be exactly the same as the lead. However, if you have a double start screw, the lead will be twice that of the pitch. Okay, and similarly, if you have a triple start screw, the lead will be three times uh, the pitch. The, the, the starts just means how many threads that you have per 360 degree turn. So this can be uh, described as the lead uh, is equal to the pitch multiplied by the number of starts of the screw. So at, at the tip here, now, I mentioned before that the tip of the screw can either be blunt or sharp, and it can either have flutes. Now, if they have flutes, it normally has two or more flutes, and this allows the screw to remove bone as it starts to uh, be turned, and this allows the screw to self-tap. Now, combined with a sharp tip, it can also self-drill. The distance between the, th the thread, um, the tips of the thread, is termed the thread diameter and the distance of the shaft itself is termed the core diameter and I mentioned the thread depth before so the thread depth is actually the difference between the thread and the core diameter divided by two and that's the effective purchase that it has on onto the bone the distance to the tip of the screw to the where, where the threads stop is termed the thread length and the distance between the head of the screw to the tip is termed the screw length. 
So these are the basic components of the screw. Now, you may be asked in the exam about what of, of these attributes affects the pull-out strength of the screw. So the pull-out strength you can think about um, in, in terms of the actual surface area that the threads have in contact with the bone. So the higher the surface area, the, the higher the pull-out strength. So what actually affects the, the surface area? Well, firstly, uh, the, the longer the screw. So if you have a longer screw with a longer thread length, that will have a higher pull-out strength, so longer screw. Secondly, the larger di the, the thread diameter, so the larger thread diameter, the, the, the more surface area it's going to purchase into the bone, so larger diameter. Thirdly, the greater the thread depth. So that makes sense. If the, the greater the thread depth, again, the more purchase you have uh, in, the, in the bone, increasing the pull-out strength. And fourthly, uh, smaller the pitch. So smaller the pitch, it means that you have more threads purchasing the bone. So all, all these four attributes increase the pull-out strength. Then you may be asked, well, what affects the bending stiffness? So the bending stiffness is determined by the second moment area, and for a cylinder, it's proportional to the fourth power of its radius. So for the screw, the core diameter, you can think of as a cylinder. So you can think um, if, if a screw has a larger core diameter, it's going to significantly increase its bending stiffness, and that is relevant in certain applications. So if you... Um, are asked about, uh, well, what attributes does a cancellous screw have? Well, you know that cancellous screws are used to purchase into cancellous trabecular bone, um, which is, is much weaker than cortical bone. So the screw, by definition, should have a much higher pull-out strength. So cancellous screws typically have um, a, a much deeper uh, thread, so a, a much higher thread depth. Um, increasing the pull-out strength. They also have a much higher thread to core diameter ratio and this also increases the pull-out strength. Um, typically uh, the, uh, the, the strength of the screw is much lower as a result of a lower core diameter but um, in, in cancellous screws it's much more important to have a higher pull-out strength whereas in cortical screws it's much more important to have uh, a higher bending stiffness. So moving on uh, from here, you may be asked how screws actually work with, within the bone. So if we take a cortical screw first and foremost and you draw the two portions of the cortex that engages. So this is a long bone that you've placed the cortical screw through. So once it engages the distal cortex, as you start turning the screw, the screw would want to advance in this direction. And conversely, or simultaneously, it pulls the cortex in the opposite direction. So this generates a shear force at the, at the bone screw thread um, uh, interface. Whereas as it continues to advance, the head engages into the proximal cortex and it arrests the linear motion of the screw going forward. So you inherently will have a tensile force within the screw itself. And this tensile force, you'll have an opposite kind of compressive force of the screw engaging into the bone or indeed into the plate. And it's the balance of these two forces um, which, which occurs with every single turn as it engages. So it's the balance of the tensile forces here with the shear forces here. The cortical screw, it works by um, causing a friction onto the, uh, onto the proximal cortex or onto the plate. As it brings the plate onto the bone, the plate, as it's compressed onto the bone, it causes a friction onto the bone and that's, that's how it's held. Now, um, it's, it's, it, as, you, as you turn the screw further and further, um, you, the, the screw may actually fail with, within the hold of the bone. And that's because 
uh, as you turn the screw further, the tensile forces here, they exceed the ultimate strength of the force, uh, of the shear forces here. And therefore you get, you get a stripping of the screw um, and, and, and eventually failure of the screw. You, may, you then may be asked how a locking screw works and a locking screw has threads in the run out and in the head which locks into the plate and therefore you do not get any tensile forces uh, in the screw and you do not get any shear forces uh, at, the, at the cortex either because it purely just locks into the, bone, uh, into the plate making an angular stable device and a, a completely uh, rigid construct. So you do not get a fri the, the plate coming down onto the bone and you do not get that friction. So simply once it locks into the plate, you purely have a, a neutrally sitting screw with, with no compression across it. And typically um, the, the, the locking screws, once locked into the plate, the whole construct is loaded. And if loaded to failure, they'll either fail at the neck which is the weakest area, which is why typically in locking screws, you have a much higher core diameter compared to the thread diameter, because it's much more important to have that bending stiffness of the screw. Um, the second way it fails is that um, if, if the whole construct um, uh, pulls out, the, the screws do not fail sequentially. If it does fail, it fails catastrophically with the whole construct pulling out. On mentioning the bending stiffness of the screw, it's also really important to note that um, distal locking screws used in tibial nails or femoral nails have a, a relatively high core diameter compared to their thread diameters. And this again is purely because uh, locking screws need to resist uh, the bending forces placed upon it. 